guys, say hello to the camera. <laughs> Bye, Bob. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage, Brian Warner. Welcome to the second annual Tithing Developer Conference. It's really great to see so many of you here, and I actually see a lot of faces out there that I recognize. Uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, my name is Brian Warner. I'm the Tithing Guy at the Linux Foundation. And let me tell you, the Linux Foundation, we are really excited about Tithing. A lot of good stuff has happened since last year's conference. Uh, we've had a few releases, most notably just recently, a few days ago. Uh, Tizen 2.1 Nectarine came out, uh, and you know we're just we're so excited to be the host of this incredible project, and we're looking forward to some really great things happening between now and next year's Tizen Developer Conference. But for the rest of this week, we've got a really great conference lined up for you. Uh, over the next few days, you have the opportunity to hear from some of the world's foremost experts on Tizen, and at the Linux Foundation. We do talk a lot about collaboration. And even in this day and age, it is absolutely true. The most effective way to get things done is in person, face to face, with the experts. And the world experts on Tizen are right here in this room. So this conference is made for conversation, collaboration, so make the most of it. Before we get started though, I'd like to give a huge thank you to all of our sponsors who did make this possible. Uh, first, I would like to thank our host sponsors, Samsung and Intel. And as you all know, both companies are really deeply engaged and committed to Tizen. And it really is thanks to them that we are here today at this conference. I'd also like to thank Open Mobile. Uh, this is their second year sponsoring. We're thrilled to have them back again. I'd like to thank all of our gold sponsors as well. There's a very strong showing of support for Tizen and for this conference. And then I would also like to thank our silver and our meal sponsors as well. So, yeah, that's fine. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, before we get started, I would like to say a few words on logistics. So this evening, uh, we do have the opening reception that's going to be right downstairs. And you are invited to come and have a few more drinks. Have a few more appetizers, relax, get over your jet lag, uh, talk a little bit before things really get started tomorrow. And they will get started bright and early. Tomorrow morning is the fun run. I expect to see all the Europeans and all the Americans who live east of Chicago tomorrow morning down in the lobby first thing. Because it's basically the middle of your day at that point. So you have no excuse. So, no, just kidding. But it will be a scenic run. Uh, down along the Embarcadero, so it's a great way to see San Francisco before San Francisco actually wakes up. So you get to see some, some good parts of the city. If running isn't your thing, maybe crawling is. Uh, at any rate, tomorrow, or tomorrow afternoon, after the sessions, we'll have the booth crawl. Uh, you can come down and talk to the sponsors. There will be beer, food, more prizes, just like what we just had out there with the passport. We'll get stamps, we'll get drawing. Uh, so it's going to be you know, very similar to today, and we encourage you to come and you know, eat some snacks and drink some beer. After that is the evening reception. This will be at the Winery SF. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this is on Treasure Island, which is the reason why we have a pirate and sailor theme. So I guess this is actually the bar. <laughs> but you don't have to bring your own eye patches. We will supply those for you. So you know, don't don't worry if you didn't come equipped. Shuttles do depart at 6.30, and then they'll be starting to return at 10 p.m. Finally, meals downstairs. So uh, breakfast and lunch are going to be downstairs in Golden Gate and then also over in Plaza. And then snacks and beer are going to be in the Hacker Lounge. If you haven't been to a Times and Development Conference before, the Hacker Lounge is a good place to go, hang out with friends, make new friends, drink some beer, eat some food, write some code, play some games. It's just a good place to go hang out. If there's nothing else going on, you, know, you should be at your sessions instead of drinking beer in there. But you know, that's where it is. With that, I would like to announce and introduce our first keynote. And this is a panel discussion. It will be moderated by Gigi Wong. 
Uh, Gigi is board member and chair emeritus at the MIT Stanford Venture Lab. So please, well, please join me in welcoming Gigi and the other panel members. tonight. Are you guys ready for a really exciting next few days? Come on! So, um, so we're here at Tizen. Let me just mention a little bit about myself. As um, Brian said, I'm with the MIT Stanford Venture Lab, but I also sit on the board of the Wireless Communications Alliance, which is a community to look at new trends in wireless. So if you guys are interested, check out WCA.org. Okay? And um, so today when we, here we're looking at Tizen and looking at, you know, the early days, we look back at mobile and we look at, you know, back in the 90s when we were carrying the brick, you know, a name not mentioned right now, the brick, and now we're here, we can't survive without our digital devices, our phones, our TVs, our tablets, and, you know, even the stuff that we have in our car. So I think ties in right now is an effort to really make the experience good for us across all different types of services and all different types of interfaces. And what we have here today are the partners, the, some of the first partners who decided to adopt ties in, to embrace it, and help especially all of you developers out there be able to have opportunities to promote your devices, to get more creative experiences, and possibly to make money. So what I'd like to do is start the panel off by um, introducing each of our panelists and then they'll each give an intro. So this is um, Trevor, he's the CEO of AppBacker. So for those of you who can't see his name tag, okay. And this is Steve, he is the CEO of Game Salad. And then we have our token engineer here, <laughs> instead of all these CEOs. We have Joel, who is an engineer for Havoc. And then we have Sandy, who is the CEO of Yo-Yo Games. And then Andrew over there is the SVP of Symphony Telecom. What I'd like for them to do, because they're probably best at it, is say in two to three lines what their company does, and in one quick thing, why they decided to partner with Tyson. Trevor? Thanks, Gigi. Uh, thanks, everybody, for uh, coming out tonight. So, Gigi mentioned my name is Trevor Cornwell. I'm the founder and CEO of AppBacker. We're a wholesale marketplace for apps. You might ask what that is. Uh, what we try and do is get the right apps to the right stores. And when Tizen started to come to be, um, we met with some very enthusiastic and compelling folks at Intel who said, this is going to be a great platform. They asked us to create an algorithm to help identify the best apps across all different platforms. What we do is we score every app from 1 to 10, and based on the score of the app, we offer incentives to developers to help them port their app uh, to Tizen. The reason we're here and the reason we're so excited about Tizen is we think that Tizen is where uh, mobile wants to be. It's a chance for apps and devices to be able to communicate um, across different platforms and methods, and we think that there's an incredible uh, horizon for uh, eyes and a head. Excellent, thank you. Uh, Steve? My name is Steve Felter, I'm the CEO of GameSolid. GameSolid is a game creation platform uh, for iOS, Android, and HTML5. So we use HTML5 to support other platforms like Tizen. Uh, we have a little over 600,000 developers that have developed over 200,000 games. Uh, on any given month, uh, we account for about 20 to 30 percent of every game published to the iOS App Store. So we've seen a lot of success on the iOS side, um, but that space is getting awfully crowded. And so uh, our responsibility to our developer community is to always be on the lookout for new distribution opportunities. And we think that Tizen really offers a promise there to unlock new distribution opportunities uh, that are not as competitive today as things like iOS and Android, uh, particularly in certain geographies like Asia, where there's a fast-growing market there, and I think a great opportunity for Tizen to flourish. Oh, thank you. Uh, Joel? 
Hi, so I'm Joel Vanenwick, and I work at Havoc, and what we do is provide um, cross-platform game technology solutions um, for games. So we do physics, anywhere from physics, cloth, destruction, middleware that allows games to create better content. And for us, we wanted to, you know, Tizen is a very exciting new platform for us, so when we saw that, we did what we did best, and we ported what we have to that platform so that more developers can take advantage of the solutions that we've been creating for years now that have empowered a lot of AAA titles, everyone from Guild Wars to Assassin's Creed. And we wanted to bring that to the mobile space. So we actually are providing a free game engine called Project Anarchy for mobile solution as well, and we're providing it completely for free for Tizen. Thank you. Sandy? Thanks, Gigi. I'm Sandy Duncan. I'm the CEO, as Gigi said, of YoYo Games Limited. YoYo is the home of Game Maker Studio. Uh, Studio is a fast cross-platform games IDE, in many ways delivering the same feature set that um, Game Salad has. The difference being that rather than having a visual methodology for creating the code, we combine visual along with actual coding. We have probably 99% of the people who use Game Maker are using it to code rather than visualize the, the, the game. Um, the, the, game, the coding language itself is um, very C-like, um, but it's a game-centric scripting language. Um, but the real key to what we do is being cross-platform. Um, we, we believe in being both native and HTML5 across web, desktop, and mobile. So we deliver today what we call exports for both HTML5, um, across desktop we have every flavor of Windows, Windows 8, um, we do OS X, and we also have an Ubuntu Linux export, which we find very interesting. Finally, on the mobile platform space, um, we support iOS, Windows Phone 8, Android, and of course, as of today, we, we, we're now shipping our Tizen export, native Tizen, as well as HTML5 on Tizen. Um, so we're very, very keen to continue to provide cross-platform services. We're really, the vision for us is to have a, a frictionless experience for our games developers. So actually, you can write that code once and deploy it instantly across all of those platforms. And we're interested in Tizen because, really for two reasons. One of them is that we really, being a cross-platform company between web, desktop, and mobile, we see many more opportunities for games as an entertainment experience on areas like television in the not too, too distant future. And um, there's a second element to it as well. You have to look at who's sponsoring this Tizen organization. The main supporters of companies like Samsung, um, Huawei, uh, and Intel, amongst others, are, are companies that know how to make markets. And if we want to deliver success to our developers, then that's going to be a very key element to our excitement here. Great, thank you. Andrew? I'm Andrew Till. I'm the SVP for uh, Symphony Teleco. I run the uh, mobile business. As a company, we provide software outsourcing services to device manufacturers and companies that want to bring new solutions to market, be it in mobile devices, uh, media devices, TV set-top boxes, the automotive industry. And we got involved in Tizen back in uh, early 2011. We had a long history with some of the forerunning platforms working with different manufacturers and had seen a lot of the challenges our customers have in bringing cross-platform experiences to market, not only cross-platform in terms of desktop and mobile, but running across those different high-volume consumer electronics devices and believe that there is a strong gap in the marketplace for somebody to come out with a platform that really addresses those issues for developers opens up a lot of uh, new experiences for consumers and we think a lot of new revenue streams and I would absolutely agree with Sandy. I think if you look at who's back in Tizen and these are some very, very powerful companies with a lot of experience over many years of bringing innovation to market and driving scale very, very rapidly and so for us it's you know, a pretty easy decision. Thank you, thank you. So a question for those of you in the audience. How many of you have developed an app or two or three? Raise your hand. So we have a lot of developers here. So you guys are wondering, well, you know, how many of you have developed on iOS? A whole bunch. And how many have developed on Android? Wow, that's more. <laughs> and so the question is, so now we have a new platform, right? I mean, when iOS first came out, you know, it a lot you know, empowered the iPhone, which is a new experience. But then Android, you know, emerged sort of in response to address some of the issues that people had with iOS. You know, if it was an alternative, it also promised to be open. But right now, 
you know, there looks like there's a need for another, some, another platform, Tizen. So the question is, some of you who, got, who are developers of both iOS and Android, you must be wondering the question, well, why should I also, you know, develop for Tizen? So I'd like to ask, um, starting with uh, Joel, because he's actually a developer himself, tell us, why do you think these developers should consider Tizen from a developer standpoint? I think it's actually pretty easy to think about, because for Tizen, it's actually really easy to port what you already have. If you have it running on iOS or Android, to port it over to something like Tizen. But also, it's a very exciting new platform, right? And it's also filling a niche that you know, Android and iOS don't exactly fill. So with Tizen, it is an even more open platform than something you have like um, Android, for example. iOS is really great because, you know, it's very locked down and you know exactly what you're deploying to. With something like Android, it's a little bit more difficult, especially from a cross-platform development standpoint, being able to deploy to every single Android device. You have to worry about different resolutions, different texture formats, all these different things. And with Tizen, you can still have wildly different looking applications, but still have an easier way to deploy to those different devices. Well, thank you. Do any of you have any thoughts, especially you, Sandy? It sounds like you, you know, you're partners with everybody, <laughs> iOS, Android, HTML5. Yo, why also do Tyson? Yeah. That's a, it's a good question. It's one I should answer probably more honestly than I would feel I should do in front of a Tizen developer <laughs> conference. Um, in many ways, we, we take that pain away from developers. I mean, if I really wanted to raise my flag as high as I could, I'd say we are the platform because it's Game Maker that we encourage people to develop to. Um, and so we're trying to go back to what I said earlier about being a frictionless experience. So at one level, we kind of don't care. Um, but at the other level, we want to deliver to our developers the opportunities to make money. And um, we see Tizen as a very obvious, has the potential to be a, a big platform. And so we're giving our developers the opportunity without too much pain, and that should be good for the people who are interested in the success of Tizen as well, to bring their skills to that platform as well, but in a frictionless way. So we're excited about Tizen from the market potential. Uh, but we don't see it from a developer's perspective as having any specific advantage of anything. Our product takes that away and anesthetizes that part. I, I think there are some uh, basic things uh, behind Tizen that uh, are going to help to make it really successful. And I think it's true for anything that we see that ultimately succeeds. There's a lot of stuff in the background. Um, I think a big part of it is the Linux Foundation. And the very fact that Linux, which is probably the most trusted uh, brand um, for developers in terms of the quality and the ethos behind uh, what they do, is the holder um, of Tizen, I think, um, is extremely important. Um, partners, absolutely. I mean, Samsung, Intel, both very forward-looking companies with the resources to be able to think strategically and, and execute on that. I think you also have carriers out there who are really enthusiastic about an open system. I think most importantly, you have consumers um, who want that. Consumers um, love the web, I and mean, we use it every single day. And what we love about it is being able to go seamlessly from idea to idea, thought to thought, app to app. And up until today, we've been constrained. We can operate in a walled garden. Tizen really breaks that walled garden. And I think for, for those reasons, it's going to be uh, a, a very successful platform for consumers and for developers. So, so something that struck me when I first learned about Tizen, and I'm still learning, is the fact that it actually supports development across different interfaces, like mobile phones, like the tablet, like PCs, TVs, and even our cars, which is going to be interesting. We'll be all talking to our cars. and so. Do, what do you guys see that you know, enables this? You know, what are the things that really enable, or, or actually first question is, do you really believe that, or this is yet another pipe dream? Or do you really see that this is enabling developers to easily develop across interfaces? And how does it help you? I'm looking at you. Oh, well, happily, thank God, I was a person. <laughs> so, yeah, maybe we're in a little 
unique position because we're today doing automotive quite late, so some of our work on, on display, um, we've done a lot of handset development work and some of that work's on display as well. I think we see a number of things, and, and Tizen is a maturing platform, it's not yet where everybody would uh, ideally like it to be, and, um, but the promise is there. And so the ability to develop good native logic and combine that with a web-based UI so that when you start taking applications across platforms, you don't have to build a Bahamut application that's trying to carry all the assets so it can naturally scale itself. You can leverage the web UI, you can download assets on the fly in different environments. If you take the Jaguar Land Rover, uh, Example, for example, there's a connected car, it'll have OT mode and capability in there, so it can download and update itself in real time. And I think that is really a strong part of the promise, being able to effectively leverage HTML5 UI development and basic logic with native functionality when you need to have that. And I think we see that as one of the big, big benefits as we, uh, as we move forward a lot of I think a lot of platforms position around that, but then you go a lot of limitations, a lot of managed code environments you have to work with, or some of the APIs are very, very restrictive. And you know, the, the, the real promise of Tizen is breaking that mold. And again, I think the other side of it is, in some platforms today, if you don't ship a device which conforms to the performance requirements, then a lot of functionality gets stripped out and there's no support in an ongoing manner for it. And that always gives developers a big question about, should I go and develop for these devices, even if they have potential, or there'll be a long-term future in it. I think when you look at the messaging around Tizen and what the, the key companies behind it are driving, these are companies that are in many, many high-volume consumer electronics markets, and they are going to run Tizen across you know, many, many device types. And that, that is just, you know, for me, the, the most exciting part. Oh, fabulous. Thank you. I, I think you know, one of the things, and we've all had the opportunity to, to work kind of behind the scenes, um, either with Intel or Samsung or both, and I think one of the things that really stands out for me is how strategic um, Tizen has been in terms of doing what it's doing. You know, we've talked about having great partners and that have resources. What I think really makes this whole uh, initiative stand out is how thoughtful everybody's been about uh, device release and where do you do that um, and how do you do that to create successes so that carriers buy in and consumers buy into it. And I think for developers the same. I think that there's a real focus both from Samsung and Intel in really curating the experience. So we're not in this race to the bottom of trying to get to X number of apps so we can satisfy uh, some analyst out there to say there's 100,000 apps. It's really an effort to get great content that, as you were talking about before, works across different platforms. And I think those are the things that consumers want, and I think that's what's going to lead to the, the success of this. So absolutely. So now, here's, here's the thing that's, I think, really important to all the developers, is that you develop, you develop your apps, right? If, you know, very few people see them, you know, it's, the return just isn't there for you. And so one of the big challenges is distribution. And so you've got partners up here who have platforms which you can develop to and develop Tizen apps to. But one of the huge challenges is distribution. You know, how do you get it out um, into multiple stores and how do you do it seamlessly? And so um, I'd like to ask Steve to address, you know, how you feel like Yo-Yo Games, you know, in partnership with Tizen, or maybe not, actually helps the developers achieve distribution? Sure, good question. <laughs> a game salad. Um, we, uh, indie developers are obviously um, having the hardest time with the proliferation of all the apps in the app stores. Uh, the big guys can afford to you know, spend a lot of money on the big media budgets and kind of buy their way into the top ranks. Uh, so indie developers need to be a little more crafty in how they, they target distribution opportunities. So I think emerging platforms is a great place to start. If there's, you know, if it's not full, then you have a great opportunity to shine in those situations. I think geographical focus is another big one that you're starting to see. So uh, with the focus on countries like Asia and emerging territories, where you can really have the ability to affect the device adoption as well. Um, and that's, I think, one of the biggest strengths that 
if I were calling your shots or ties, and I would be focused on that strategy. Um, so I think having a geographic focus and, and knowing where those stores are and really optimizing your game around those local markets is a great strategy, and I think ties will play a big role in that. Um, and then personally, within the game salad environment, we are always trying to think about ways to help developers with the distribution. So we've created our own cross-promotion technology, which is one of the most successful ways to drive installs in the app environment. Uh, and so what we do is we provide um, basically screen real estate that allows developers to recommend other games. We have a, an intelligent recommendation algorithm that, that targets by genre and personal usage. And it allows people to share traffic. And so if I want to put this onto my game, I'm allowed to you know, promote these other games. And in exchange for referring traffic out, I get known traffic back in. So we're, we're hoping to create geographic pockets of cross-promotion opportunities in emerging app stores uh, built around the ties of the You know, in, in that, you know, just to take a look what you've said a little bit further, because you've been talking about geographical. I know Joel's been spending a lot of time in China. I mean, do you guys have any insights or recommendations on geographical? Uh, well, I'll, I'll let Joel chime in, but we found, well, I'll just admit that I don't know anything about operating in China very well, <laughs> just up front. Um, so what we decided to do was take a partnership approach. So identifying big established players in these various geographies and really getting behind their, their market know-how. So China, for example, I think it's the second largest player market, certainly for iOS, probably across mobile. Uh, Monetization is still a little tricky there, but uh, it will certainly catch up. Um, so we partnered with Tencent to help us enter the China market. We localized our tool set into, uh, into simplified Chinese. We used things like carrier billing for China Mobile, uh, QQ Network for social networking abilities, and really try to create an infrastructure that's targeted around adoption in those environments. Um, so that was kind of our focus going into China. And I think you know, Intel and a lot of the partners that they're working with all have regional dominance, you know, whether it's Korea, Japan, and China. And so really getting behind that partnership know-how and using that market um, to, to really you know, piggyback on their, their market now. Right, right. So, um, so the two people on the end are actually from Great Britain, so they've flown here. <laughs> and so you'll, you'll, why don't we do this as Joel? You, I know because you spent so much time on China, if you can like provide the developers any insight, but then I'd like to jump to the other side of the world and hear how things over on that side of the pond. Oh, well, I think for us it's, it's still about adoption, right? Creating good tools, basically like what you Said, being able to localize what we have, localizing documentation. We're a mobile provider, so for us, it's kind of we're trying to abstract away any pain that you have on a particular platform. So for us, it's you know targeting key developers, targeting, making sure that what we have is easy for even small developers to start getting up and running with, and providing a potentially free solution so that people who don't know about us, who have never heard of who we are, can start using our tools and start to develop games before having to invest some large sum of money before you know, knowing if it's going to pan out or not. So, so. Thank you. You'll give me? Yeah. yeah. All right, okay, right, right, right. Sure. Um, I, I, I'm just going to go back to the, the opportunity for developers a little bit around what's happening with Tizen. And I think there's a big challenge that, that has to be resolved. And I see progress, but I don't think I see enough. And I see opportunity here as well. And that's about the user experience with content. Um, two elements to that. One is the store itself. How does the store get itself presented to the users? I mean, if you think about the discovery issue, as an example, on other operating system platforms, where you can only really genuinely navigate the top 10 or top 20. And yet, two-thirds, according to Flurry, last year, two-thirds of the revenue from, from, from the app stores, that's about a $10 billion business, was coming from apps below the top 100. And so, I, I can't solve for the challenge, but I think I would throw that out to the people creating the platform and the operating system to think about those other pieces of the equation and that how can you make this a better experience for developers to have their content discovered around your platform. There's a second little piece of that, which is having acquired the content, what are my rights? One of the coolest things to do where you have content that you've purchased on one product or one device segment is to have that available to you in another. So in other words, if I bought some music I want to listen to on my phone, what are my rights with that music when I get home? Can I listen to that on my other devices that may well be running Tizen in the future? Can I listen to it in my car properly, uh, legally? Does it just seamlessly interface? Um, you know, within the games area, can I run my game on my, my phone and can I run the same game on my TV? It might actually be a slightly different version of the game. 
It's not just necessarily the same code. So I, I, you know, I kind of throw that back out to the people creating Tizen and say, you can create the most wonderful experience here by learning from the mistakes and the errors and the walled gardens that you refer to that exist in these other operating system platforms in, in the space. Uh, Andrew, some of your thoughts? I think if you, if you look at the European market, it's, it's very interesting. It's, first of all, it's clearly a very fragmented market. You've got lots of countries, lots of different languages that you have to deal with. And one of the, the big benefits of Tizen in the open nature is a localization framework. You can really localize Tizen to a very extreme level. And I, I hope and encourage the device manufacturers to really exploit that and expose that to developers in the final product so that you're able to bring solutions to market, applications or services that are truly focused on the countries you're going after. I think then on the, on the discovery part, I think that's true. I would, I would say don't just think about discovery on device. I think a lot of people in Europe find content through things like social networks, Facebook recommendation services. So make sure that you've got links into those and it's very, very easy to discover those online. It may be if you're a PC and you're finding it through TV or your phone. But uh, it's not all about just how you discover the content on the on the phone. It's certainly not from the European usage model. And I think the, the final one, and the one that I find very interesting, is you know, if I think about the UK, we have very big Chinese populations, very big Indian populations. But when you go to things like the iOS store, most of the applications are in English, and you can't get the Chinese version. And that is a massive, massive oversight. And I think for a lot of developers, you know, if you think very carefully about the markets you target and look at the geographic diversity of those countries, then that will give you some very interesting ways of, of differentiating and getting traction very, very early on the, uh, on the platform. So you're basically saying, if I live in the UK, but I want my Chinese version, one of the things Tizen does is to enable to do, to uh, get my Chinese version in the UK versus having to go to China. Absolutely, a lot of the app stores are restrictive or developers do is they package a, a limited number of locales in with the, uh, the application. So you can have you know, German, French, English, eFix effectively. But there is a very big market out there, um, and it's not just in the UK, it's in most of the major European markets, mm -hmm. or Chinese, or Hindi, and you know, many, many other, uh, many, many other languages. And I think you know, a lot of people have just completely overlooked that opportunity. And then the funny thing is, I'm the one Chinese up here on the panel, but Joel there actually speaks much better Chinese than me. <laughs> so, Joel, you are the developer. Seriously, I mean, you know, some of the platforms that have come out that, you know, for developers, you know, they, they have a promise of all these things, but they're a pain in the ass to use. <laughs> so, I mean, from what you see from an engineering standpoint, it is Tyson easy to use? I mean, it, it definitely seems, uh, from a porting perspective, going from already supporting iOS and Android, porting over to Tyson was definitely relatively painless, right? Um, but, you know, we, we, we're still looking for improvements in certain areas, maybe something like Visual Studio integration or something like that. And it's, it's definitely getting better, and the things like localization are definitely a huge thing as well. Providing something like Android, where it's really difficult to deploy to different devices, where you have different resolutions, you have to handle a lot of different specs. Um, something like Tizen, which sort of abstracts that away, so you can still work in, you, you know that if you develop it for this one thing, that it's going to work on all devices that support Tizen, that's a burden off of us, right? For as middleware developers, because our job is always to make it easier for developers to create games on every platform. So we hope that we already do that with all of our tool sets. Um, but Tizen makes lifts the burden a little bit off of us as a middleware provider to make it easier and gives us more confidence that people who use our tool set can deploy to all platforms and still have the same experience. I was just going to say, you know, it's one of these interesting and for all of us in this room, I mean, we're you're present right at the beginning from something that's being created. It's, it's exciting to watch. It, at AppFactor, we look at building a new platform as really a two-sided problem. Um, you know, for a developer, you have to make the calculus, is this the right platform for me? And from a store, you have to make the calculus of saying, how do I find the right developers? 
what we found is uh, an algorithmic approach really helps. And there are hundreds of thousands of apps out there. And the, the big challenge, now looking at it just from the, the store standpoint, or from the Python common store standpoint, how do you find which iOS apps, which Android apps you want to bring onto the platform? There are great tools to be able to very uh, simply, simply and seamlessly uh, port an app. But you have to find them first. And that's where we've really focused. And um, I just put in a plug for us that um, we're going to be downstairs tomorrow and um, want uh, to have developers come by and get their apps scored because it's, it's an incredible thing to see how many good apps there are. And we've gone in and done a really deep dive to look at what are the attributes that make an app successful. And we think that really solves a problem for a developer because then he can come and see my app has the real potential to be successful on this new platform and makes it an easier calculus for them to decide to, um, to put their time and effort into uh, according to Tyson. Excellent, excellent. So I have a question for you guys. How many people here, you know, app developers, have developed games? So quite a few games out there. I've got two sons, so I see a lot of games in my house. And, and you know, what, the games has totally evolved from the early days of Pong, right, that we did. Boom, boom, boom. And one of the things is that Tizen, you know, one of its promises is that it allows for specialization, for putting in new features, for putting in new models, interactions, things like that. So I'd like to ask the, um, Steve to tell us more. Is, does it really, does it really allow for the developers to add more specialization in their games and to add more ways to get money from us? It's a good question. And <clears throat> I may need to defer some others that have really explored the, uh, the, the unique feature sets. Um, you know, at GameStop, we, we, you know, we work cross-platform tools. We try to first cover the you know, lowest common denominator to make sure there's not a whole lot of special nuances you need to, to apply to that. Uh, but then as the platform takes off, we like to specialize within that platform. So we're just starting at the base level today, but I was out on the floor and I saw a really cool demo. And so uh, somebody was showing me a, um, uh, a game that had like a guitar strings on it. You can brush your finger across it and you can feel it vibrate in a different intensity depending on the thickness of the string. So that's a pretty cool tech demo. And then he's saying, well, you can take it on Angry Birds and you can launch it and you can feel the, the rubber snap and things like that. So I think new features like that that really kind of add to the overall immersiveness of gameplay, I think, you know, will we'll help differentiate the project. Fabulous. Um, Sandy, do you want to jump in? We've got two game platforms here. <laughs> and you notice they're not sitting next to each other. I, I'm just trying to be really polite about this, but I, 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 in some ways we hate all this differentiation. There's nothing worse than finding out somebody's developed a handset phone thing that's got four joysticks on it. Because then we were asked to go out and support all of that in our platform, because we try to abstract all that stuff. Um, we just need to make that easier to do. Oh, well, <laughs> yeah, we have to do it. But actually, we do make it. I, on the other side, it, it's, a, it's something that we are working on anyway, which is to make it easier for our developers to, to extend our platform to, to support these kind of features. But I think they become quite confusing for consumers too. The, you know, how much can you innovate by the phone platform? Um, I prefer to see it thinking in the terms of different devices rather than getting too intricate about, you know, I've got more haptics than the other guy's got or something. It, it doesn't add enough for me to the game, the games, and I'm talking games here, to, to the gaming experience. I think that game is about a few fundamental elements and that they need to be provided well, like great graphics performance. I'd much rather see that than have five widget buttons down the side of the phone I can press. But Tyson allows for any of those. And I said I might upset a few people, <laughs> didn't I, right? So, you know, and my, my message I told you, hand, for handset manufacturers, please don't put too many buttons and stuff on the devices. They're not good for me, they're not good for consumers. That's because, that's because I, I think you're at the age where you need reading glasses. <laughs> I've got bifocals. <laughs> so, um, we're, our time is running to a close. What I'd like to do is ask each one of the panelists to as they work with, you know, you know their partners for you developers to work with, and so, you know, from their perspective as the partners, is for them each to give you guys, developers, a bit of advice 
about what you should do in order to move forward and adopt Tizen or consider it and you know work with them specifically on their platform. So, Andrew. So I think um, you know we've actually done quite a lot of Tizen development and uh, bringing applications. Um, out with different partners. We are running a session on Friday where we talk about how to do um, HTML5 based UI using message board bridging back into native code for applications. So I think the, the tuning guys are here, we work with them to bring what is a fairly advanced, very popular application to the uh, market on, on Tyson. So what my advice would be come along on Friday, the guys will go through a lot of code examples of how we did that and get some you know great hands on learning. Thank you. Andy? Okay, I've got an opinion. What? Um, no, <laughs> seriously. Um, I, I think in the early days of any platform, we, we were approached by Apple in 2007. They heard we had tons of games in, our, in the way we were at the time. And that, you know, we, we walked past that opportunity at the time. But I don't regret it because the investment we'd have had to make to support iOS in 2007 would have been disproportionate. And so what I'd say is that. For developers, you've got to kind of insulate yourselves from this hardware cycle or from hardware innovation at this stage. And so I think a tools approach is very, very valid, especially in the early stages of a platform's development. And that applies to me, Harvard, Game Salad, wherever. Or if you don't like it being too tool-centric, I'd look at extracting what are the standards in the platform first. Go for the things that are common denominators that you're familiar with. And one thing we haven't actually discussed much here is HTML5. And actually, we found terrific HTML5 performance on the Tizen device that we've tested so far. It's the best we've seen. I think it can still get better, but it's the best we've seen. So, tools, extract standards, don't be too adventurous, I think, at this stage. I know some Tizen people may not like to hear me say that too forcefully, because I think they have to create the market first. Thank you, Joe.